So, folks, reports began circulating on the Internet today, still unconfirmed. The capital of Saudi Arabia was hit by, by some kind of airstrike, whether it was missiles, whether it was drones, regardless, that Riyadh was hit. Now, it's not totally confirmed yet. The, the reports are out there, but it's not confirmed who did it, what exactly happened. But that draws our attention to the situation in Yemen. Yemen. It's a country on the Arabian Peninsula, one of the poorest countries in the world, and it has been subject to an all-out attack and assault by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and its allies. This attack has not stopped since the coronavirus pandemic began. It has been relentless. As a result of Saudi Arabia's attack, destroying water treatment facilities, destroying power plants, over one million people in Yemen have gotten cholera. One million people have gotten cholera, a preventable disease. And it's because of the Saudi bombing of Yemen that their water's not being properly purified, that people are being exposed, and, and cholera. There's been a cholera outbreak. One million people have cholera. The situation in Yemen is bleak, but the people there continue to fight back against all odds. The resistance of the people of Yemen should be deeply, deeply inspiring to anyone who is opposed to capitalism and imperialism. The situation in Yemen, it started with the, the Arab Spring. I mean, it, it's kind of started before that, but it started with the Arab Spring. Um, you know, the government of Yemen is basically a puppet of Saudi Arabia. And during the Arab Spring, the people rose up against that. Now, the people in the north, the people they call the Houthis, which are Zaydi Shias, they call themselves Ansar Allah, which means followers of God. The Zaydi Shia Muslims have been fighting the government for a long time. 2011, the Arab, Spring part, the Arab Spring happened. There was an uprising in the country that toppled the government. Popular committees were formed around the country. It was a revolutionary situation. And then uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia forced an election on the country in which there was only one candidate on the ballot. In, in the aftermath of the revolution, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia forces an election. And let me repeat that. There was one candidate on the ballot. His name is Mansour Hadi. He's a Saudi puppet. He's a Saudi businessman tied to the Saudis. He's just the Saudis' man in Yemen. And so he won the election, being the only candidate on the ballot. Uh, Mansour Hadi, uh, you know, became the puppet dictator of Saudi Arabia. But the revolutionary spirit that began, you know, during the Arab Spring that had already been taking place in the north, in the north of Yemen, among the Zaydi Shia Muslims, continued. And a revolutionary army was formed, a revolutionary committee was formed, and eventually they seized the capital. At that point in 2015, after the revolutionary committee seized the capital, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia went into all-out war and started unloading bombs and missiles on the people of Yemen, killing people left and right. Uh, that May, I went on a ship with the Red Crescent Society of the Islamic Republic of Iran to try and deliver medical aid to the people of Yemen. Uh, I was unable to complete the mission because the port of Hodaida, where we were set to dock, was bombed eight times in a single day on the, the day we were supposed to arrive. But it was a life-changing experience for me, and I came to understand the situation in Yemen. The Houthis are revolutionaries. They are anti-capitalists. Uh, they are inspired largely by Bolivarian socialism, but also by the Iranian revolution. Um, you know, they talk about not capitalism, but Islam. Um, and creating an Islamic socialist society in Yemen. Um, they, are, they are revolutionaries. Their, their, their logo, the logo of the Houthis, uh, actually, or the Ansar Allah group, uh, is actually, it's, it's a hand holding a gun, which represents the right to armed struggle. Um, and the hand is supposed to be the hand of God, and the hand is pointing up. Um, it's similar to the Hezbollah logo. But they also have, perpendicular to the hand, uh, they have a shaft of wheat, which stands for economic development. 
And that's largely what the revolution in Yemen is about. It's about the people of Yemen fighting for economic development. Yemen has a huge, huge untapped reserve of oil. The Saudis want to keep it in their back pocket. That if they, if they ever run low or something happens, or the price goes up or whatever, they can take Yemen's oil. But they're just keeping the oil in the ground. Well, what the Houthis want to do is what the Iranians have done and what the what the Venezuelans have done. They want to take control of their oil. They want to make the oil public property and use it to economically develop Yemen. That's what, that's what the war is about, basically. It's a war over economic development. Now, what's interesting is there's a lot of forces in Yemen that have switched sides. You know, the Houthis are consistently anti-imperialist, anti-Saudi. Um, Hadi is consistently the Saudi's puppet. But there is this thing called the Southern Transitional Council, that goes back and forth. And there are many different political parties in Yemen. You know, there's the there's the, the Yemeni Socialist Party, which is the former ruling party of South Yemen. South Yemen, let's remember, at one point was a socialist country. It was the Democratic People's Republic of Yemen, the DPRY. And the Yemeni Socialist Party is a party that, that was the ruling party in South Yemen. Um, there's also, uh, there's also uh, Nasserists, followers of the Arab socialist Abdul Nasser. There's Baathist Arab socialists in Yemen. Um, and there are different factions in Yemen. Um, and there are, those factions are largely divided. There are people in the, uh, in the Southern Transitional Government that are part of the Nasserist movement, that are part of the, the Baath movement or the Yemeni Socialist Party. But there's also a lot of Yemeni socialists that are big supporters of, um, uh, big supporters of the Houthis and their revolutionary committee. It's divided. It's very, very divided, and there's constantly an effort to, to buy folks off. What was interesting is recently we saw that the Southern Transitional Council, which was aligned with, with the United Arab Emirates and was backed by the UAE, started fighting with the Saudi puppets, with Mansur Hadi. And so there was a split in the anti-Houthi camp. Um, now, they, they reached an agreement in 2019, but that agreement hasn't been fully agreed on. And so even among the anti uh, anti-Houthi forces, there's big divisions. But regardless, the revolutionary movement in Yemen is is the Ansar Allah movement and their allies. Their allies are communists like the Southern Movement, people that want to restore the DPRY in the South. Their allies are Arab nationalists. Um, you know, the Houthis are a religious minority in Yemen. They are Zaidi Shia Muslims. They very much favor a federal system where they would be able to have a Shia Muslim government in the North the, uh, the, the Marxists would be able to have a secular, you know, Marxist government in the South, uh, and they, they favor a federal system. So with one united Yemen, but different, uh, different ideologies, different regions having their own beliefs. That's basically what they're calling for. Um, and this revolution has continued. Uh, we heard a very long message last Thursday from Abdul Malik al-Houthi, who is the leader of the, the Ansar Allah movement. He gave a lengthy address calling out the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, saying that they essentially have betrayed the Muslim world and to do the dirty work of the United States and Israel. Um, I mean, it's, it's an ongoing situation there, but, but the UN has condemned what Saudi Arabia is doing. I mean, one million cases of cholera. The U.S. Congress voted to end all of U.S. weapons sales and support for the war in Yemen, and Trump vetoed it. And Trump has doubled down to support the Saudi regime, the Saudi monarchy, and crushing, crushing the people of Yemen. And, you know, here's what's really wild, right? The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia doesn't make any, any pretense of being democratic. It is an autocratic monarchy. The government that they're supporting in Yemen, the Hadi regime, is not democratic at all. It had one candidate on the ballot selected by the Saudis. Meanwhile, the Houthis... And in the revolutionary committees and popular assemblies that they've built, people are more involved than ever before. The population is involved. They vote on resolutions. They debate late into the night. The revolutionary movement in Yemen has formed these councils and assemblies in every neighborhood and every block, and that's why they're winning the war. That's why they have survived so long. Saudi Arabia has the fourth largest military budget of any country in the world, uh, but yet this tiny, tiny country... Yemen, this deeply, deeply poor, tiny, desertous, undeveloped country has been waging a war against the Saudis and against the Western capitalists who back them for five years now. And it has been continuing. And this is, this is David and Goliath. I mean, this is, this is a people, a Bedouin people, right, that are, that are resisting 
resisting hell and high water waged against them by imperialism. This is the Vietnam of our generation, right? I mean, this is unprecedented. This is, this is a story of people who love their country and love their homeland and love their people resisting. And what's amazing about it is you have secular Marxist-Leninists and secular Arab nationalists and Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims all joining arm in arm to resist. Meanwhile, it's the Saudi coalition. It's fractured, right? You've got the Southern Transitional Council. You've got Mansur Hadi. And the Yemeni people for five years have come together to resist. And they, they fight back with everything they have. This is, this is the unbelievable, unbelievable... Uh, story of our generation. And the fact that the U.S. media kind of looks the other way and pretends it's not happening, the reason that they pretend it's not happening is because it doesn't fit their narrative at all. This isn't supposed to happen. Poor people with nothing, with barely any weapons, are not not supposed to be able to, to beat back the fourth largest military in the world, the fourth largest military budget, the, you know, backed by the United States. You know, the blood of U.S. imperialism, I mean, U.S. imperialism is behind what the Saudis are doing. U.S. military folks, advisors are telling the Saudis where to bomb. The USA has been giving satellite support to the Saudis in Yemen. Like I said, Congress made a resolution demanding that no more money from the United States go to back the Saudi war against Yemen, and Trump vetoed it. But regardless of all of this, regardless of all of this, the people of Yemen are fighting back heroically. I mean, this is unprecedented unprecedented. You know, and people want to want to miss what this is about, right? People point to the fact that there are some anti-Semitic statements that were made by the Houthis. You know, I don't I don't embrace anti-Semitism or hatred or bigotry against anybody on the basis of their religion. People want to point to to allegations that Iran is supporting the Houthis. They're missing the point. They're missing the point. We are seeing a nation that has been a colony of Saudi Arabia kept poor by Saudi domination and western imperialism fighting back and fighting for its life against all odds. We're seeing people of different religious backgrounds and different ethnicities within Yemen standing arm in arm. We're seeing the poorest country in the world raise its head and push back one of the wealthiest countries in the world. This is unprecedented, what's happening in Yemen. It is unprecedented. This hasn't happened in a long time. This is Vietnam all over again. This is David and Goliath. This is, this is something... This is something special, and that's why, that's why you're not hearing anything about it. You're not hearing anything about it in mainstream media, right? I mean, the, the head of the Houthis just gave this lengthy speech calling out U.S. imperialism, calling out Israel, calling out capitalism, a lengthy address, didn't hear anything about it. Um, and it is really unprecedented, but the humanitarian toll has been massive as well. One million, one million cases of cholera, right? One million cases of cholera. Unbelievable. So I wanted to talk about that because it needs to be talked about. But it points to the bigger trend in the world today, which is what is the focus of my little update here. Socialism. 21st century socialism. Not, not Soviet-style socialism, but 21st century socialism is battling against Western capitalism and imperialism. Right? It's happening again. This is Cold War 2.0, but it's a little bit different. Right? It's not an ideological Cold War. It's a Cold War between anti-imperialism and socialism and resistance and Western capitalism. It's not the Cold War. It's not, it's not the old Cold War. This is, this is the new situation. And it's playing out in a number of countries right now. Right? I mean, someone already super chatted me and asked me about Meng. Meng, the CFO of Huawei Technologies. In case you didn't know, Huawei Technologies is the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the entire world. Nobody makes more phones and more, uh, more products that are telecommunications related than Huawei Technologies does. It is a huge company. And if you'll go to my Twitter page, you will see an article that I tweeted from the Harvard Business Review. All right, so this is not from People's Daily. This is not from Global Times. This is not from CCTV. This is from the Harvard Business Review. In 2015, Harvard Business Review wrote an article about Huawei Technologies saying that it was an example of profit sharing working. It says Huawei is a, an example of profit sharing working. Read the article. 
Harvard Business Review did an extensive study of Huawei Technologies, the Chinese state-controlled mega corporation, and acknowledged that it's a co-op. The profits are shared by the workers, right? Not equally, of course not equally. The CEOs and all of them make, you have a bigger share, but the wages of Huawei workers are based on how much the company earns. They share in the profits. And Huawei is a basically a cooperative under Chinese law. Um, and it's hugely successful. And it makes phones that are way better than iPhones. Uh, I mean, way better than Samsung. They're making the best phones in the world. They're closely tied in with the Chinese state. They're a cooperative and they're a state-controlled corporation. They don't function according to the logic of the market. They do what the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese military say. Uh, their the workers share in the profits. Huawei points to the future. Is it perfect? No. I mean, is there corruption there? I'm sure there's problems there. But in China, everybody wants to work at Huawei. Huawei workers make better wages than most people. Huawei workers uh, have better benefits than most people do. Huawei is like the ideal place to work. Huawei Technologies. And, you know, not surprisingly, 18 months ago, Meng, who is the daughter of the founder of Huawei, Meng, uh, the CFO of Huawei, was arrested in Canada. Now, there's been some new developments in her case because Meng was the CFO. They arrested her alleging that Huawei Technologies was doing business with Iran, right? Interestingly, that relates to what we were talking about before because that's the USA's justification for supporting Saudi Arabia and attacking Yemen. They said the Yemenis get support from Iran. And the same argument against Huawei, Huawei does business with Iran. So based on that, they arrested, they arrested Meng, uh, the CFO, and she's been in Canada in house arrest uh, with an ankle bracelet on. Um, but there is apparently a, a new hope in her case because in this new book that came out, published by John Bolton, John Bolton's memoir of what it was like to work in the Trump administration, John Bolton admits that Donald Trump was hoping to use Mung as political leverage, political leverage for his trade deal with China. So on the basis of Bolton's book, Mung may be able to you know, block extradition. Right now, Canada is deciding whether or not to extradite Mung to the United States to be charged with doing business with Iran and aiding terrorism and all this stuff. So, so we now have a situation where we've got smoking gun evidence. We got John Bolton's book where John Bolton admits, John Bolton admits that arresting her was a political decision. It was not about law enforcement. They were going to use her as a bargaining chip. They were going to use the CFO and the daughter of the, of the very, very successful Chinese corporation, Chinese cooperative, I should say. They were going to use her as a bargaining chip. So there you go. Now, 18 months, she's been in house arrest in Canada, but hopefully, hopefully she will be returned to China to be with her family and to be with the other folks who work at Huawei, to be with her father, the founder of Huawei, so very soon. We shall just have to see. This is a quite a long extradition proceeding, right? 18 months she's been in Canada uh, fighting extradition. Quite, quite a day. And I've got more to say about John Bolton's book. Speaking of John Bolton's book, Folks will know that the book accuses Donald Trump of wavering in his support of Juan Guaido. Juan Guaido, the U.S. appointed president of Venezuela. Apparently, Donald Trump wavered in supporting Guaido, saying he didn't think he was a strong leader, saying he didn't think he really had a chance of taking power in Venezuela. John Bolton, being the crazy war hawk extremist he is, is quite mad about that. Um, and John Bolton basically accuses Donald Trump of not really wanting regime change in Venezuela bad enough. That's a big point in the new book. John Bolton basically says that, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that Trump is not enthusiastic enough about regime change in Venezuela. And so then we've got Joe Biden today speaking up on Twitter and accusing Trump of, quote, saying that Trump, quote, admires thugs and dictators like Maduro. Let me repeat that. Donald Trump has been accused by Joe Biden. Of, uh, by, Joe Biden says he admires thugs and dictators like Maduro. Now, 
Donald Trump then shot back and said the only time he would ever, 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 the only time he would ever consider meeting with Maduro was to meet with him, you know, to discuss his pushing out of power. Trump is trying to beat his chest and say he's more, you know, more, uh, more, you know, pro-war. And the, the two presidential candidates are now trying to one-up each other on who's the most anti-Maduro and anti-Venezuelan. Um, but it's pretty wild. Now, back, back to show how this is all once again connected, what just happened in Venezuela. The first Iranian supermarket is about to open in Venezuela, right? Food has arrived from Iran, and there's going to be an entire food supermarket with all Iranian products that opens in Venezuela. Venezuela and Iran are getting closer than ever. And I got to tell you, I've been to Venezuela. I've been to Venezuela, and I've seen that one of the strengths of the Venezuelan revolution is what they call colectivos. And what are colectivos? They're little, little cooperative communities where the people there, there's a factory that's worker-owned, and there's neighborhoods where they all live together. It's these little socialist cities or communist cities, they call them, colectivos, communes, that they've built throughout Venezuela. I visited two of them in central Caracas. Um, one of them was a Christian, Christian socialist cooperative. The other was a communist party owned cooperative. Uh, but I visited them and I saw that how the, the working people, they live together. Uh, they work together. They organize their own security. They all have their own TV stations that broadcast socialist and revolutionary politics from there. These beautiful apartment buildings. They have like classes for the children to learn music. I visited the collectivos and that those collectivos is where Maduro draws his strength. By having this, these areas that are under socialist control, right? They have a lot of free market stuff in Venezuela. The government controls the oil. But there are these little socialistic cities and socialistic communities and collectivos and cooperative businesses and worker-owned factories. There's a worker-owned concrete factory in Venezuela. And the socialist government of Venezuela draws its strength, draws its strength from those cooperatives, from those collectivos. Fascinating. Now, someone else requested that I talk about what's going on in Lugansk, in the People's Republic. Now, for those of you not familiar with the situation in Ukraine and what happened, we know in 2014, the United States backed extremist forces that violently overthrew the government of Ukraine. The Kiev government was toppled in a military coup. The Euro made an event. Uh, radicals and extremists uh, took power. They tore down the World War II memorials. They outlawed the teaching of the Russian language in school, even though that's what the majority of people in, uh, in Ukraine speak. They speak Russian, um, right? And then in response to that, um, you know, the people of Crimea voted to join with Russia, right? And the referendum and the Russian military base was already there and they voted to join with Russia. So Crimea joined with Russia. And then we know that in Lugansk, uh, in Donetsk, in, you know, other other parts of eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region, uh, there were, you know, various people's republics that were formed. Uh, the People's Republic of Donetsk, the People's Republic of Lugansk, and they declared independence from Ukraine. They declared themselves to be uh, people's republics. Um, and what I just described to you about Venezuela, about the collectivos, is happening in east Ukraine as well. Worker-owned factories, popular committees, you know, the same kind of thing I told you about in Yemen where people of different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, different beliefs are forming popular committees, getting involved in politics. And the same kind of thing I talked about with Huawei, about this me mega co corporation that's like a cooperative. It's happening all over the world. A, a new form of economic institution is emerging. And states that are sympathetic to these new forms of economic organization are, are resisting imperialism. Um, and Lugansk, you know, they were shelled horrendously back in May. Uh, you know, there, there was bombing that, that cut off their electricity and caused some problems. And the government in Kiev very much seems to not want to implement the Minsk agreement and seems to be threatening the people of, the, of, the, of those eastern republics that, that declared independence. And it's communists there, right? It's the communist parties that are leading those areas in coalition with Russian and Slavic nationalists. It's, it's, it's a, a new form of popular power that's emerged in the, the People's Republics. Another example, within Russia itself, Lenin Farms. I bet people don't know about Lenin Farms in Russia. Well, that's where Russia gets its strawberries. 
there is this huge farm, collective, cooperative, in Russia, called Lenin Farms. It's owned by the Communist Party, right? And everyone, I mean, it's a Communist Party business. It's a co-op, and every worker gets a share. It's named after Vladimir Lenin, and it's a huge strawberry farm, right? Lenin Farms. The leader of it is Pavel Grudinin, who was the Communist Party candidate in the last presidential election they had. I actually had the honor of meeting him on election night, um, along with uh, Zhuganov, who was uh, the longtime head of the Russian Communist Party. Um, and they have this beautiful, beautiful farm cooperative. Again, that's where Russia gets its strawberries. Not a, not a, not a capitalist institution, a, a collectivo, a cooperative like Huawei, right? And the pay of people who work at Lenin Farms is three times the average pay of a Russian worker. They're making three times what most people make. All the children of people whose parents go to Len work at Lenin Farms, they get to go to a very high quality school, a very, very good school uh, that they have for the children of those who work there. And it's beautiful. I've actually, I've never been inside of Lenin Farms, but I have seen it from a distance. When I was driving from the airport into Moscow, I saw Lenin Farms and it's beautiful. And they've got a big picture of Lenin out there. It's decorated like something from the Soviet Union. It's got a very nice gate, you know, Lenin Farms. This is happening. This is happening everywhere. Um, Everywhere this is happening. And again, I, I tell you about all these different countries. I told you about Ukraine and the resistance going on there. I told you about Yemen. I told you about Venezuela. And what I'm telling you about, it's the same story over and over and over again. I told you about China. It's the same story over and over and over again. Western capitalism is this belief that individualism comes before all else. And that's the ironic thing about John Bolton's book. John Bolton's book basically puts out the message that Donald Trump is putting his own selfish interest above the interests of Western capitalism overall. That's basically what it says, that Donald Trump, in his staff meetings at the White House, he was focused on getting reelected and putting his own self-interest above the interests of Western capitalism. And John Bolton thinks that's a bad thing, and so does Joe Biden, and so do a lot of the voices. But here's the thing. What has been the mantra of Western capitalism? For so long, the mantra has been selfishness, right? Greed is good. Ayn Rand wrote a book, The Virtue of Selfishness, right? This is the belief. Trump is, Trump is basically the ideal hippie, if you think about it. You know, any new left, older folks, you know, forgive me. But, but you know, there was Marxist politics, you know, and then there was the new left. And the new left, and they replaced Workers of the World Unite with do your own thing, right? And if you look at Donald Trump, right, he's not uptight. He uses foul language. He's got a crazy haircut. He doesn't have any loyalty to the country. He's just looking out for himself. He's doing his own thing. Donald Trump is an expression of that, of that you know, baby boomer, nonconformity, new left stuff. That's basically what Donald Trump is, right? You remember, if you'll remember correctly, Donald Trump... Uh, he did not fight in Vietnam, but he says that he got venereal disease many times during the Vietnam War and that his struggle with venereal disease was his own personal Vietnam, right? I mean, he had, I mean, Donald Trump, Donald Trump is basically, um, if you take, you know, the, the, you know, the influence of Marxism and socialism out of the left of the 1960s and out of the new left, if you just make it a cultural revolution, right? Donald Trump with his crass sexual remarks, Donald Trump with his pure selfishness, Donald Trump with his, you know, non-nonconformity. You know, Donald Trump is basically an expression, and he himself is a baby boomer. He's an expression of the the cultural degeneration of Western capitalism. Western capitalism has been telling people for the longest time they don't need to have any loyalty to anything, right? No loyalty to country, no class identity. You know that they, it's just you, an atomized individual against the world right? It's you, you're on your own, individualism above all else. That is what Western capitalism has been beating the drum, the mantra of think for yourself, do your own thing. You are an individual against the collective. That's what Western capitalism has been telling people for so long. And Donald Trump, this is that logic, right? If, if people have no obligation to the nation, if they have no obligation to others, if they are not part of a collective, if they're just looking out for number one, they start to sound a lot like Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump, Donald Trump is very much an expression of what the Western world has wanted for so long. Individualism above all else. But all over the planet, 
people are resisting that ideology. People in Yemen are resisting that ideology. People in Venezuela are resisting that ideology. People in Donbass are resisting that ideology. People in Russia are resisting that ideology. People in China are resisting that ideology. All over the planet, people are pushing back against greed is good, individualism, and they're pushing back and forming cooperative institutions, collective institutions, places where people have an identity, a concept of who they are as a people. They are rejecting, they are rejecting the radical deconstruction and, and atomized individualism that defines Western society. They are rejecting it. And part of doing that has been building these kind of socialist cities and cooperatives, right? That's been a big part of it. And I'm here to tell you folks that as much as you might think things are pretty bleak here in the United States with the pandemic, with, you know, the police state, with the unrest, with the mass unemployment, I got to tell you that socialist cities are a big part of American history. Believe it or not, Google Zor, Z-O-A-R, Zor. Zor was a socialist city in Ohio, right? It was in Akron, Ohio, not too far from where I grew up. I mean, it was all, all gone by the time I was born. But back at the time Ohio was being settled, there were a group of utopians, socialists, who went to Zor. And near Akron, Ohio, they built, they built a socialist city. The man who first used the word socialism in the English language, Robert Owen, a Scotsman, he moved to Indiana and he built a socialist city, New Harmony. And he built a socialist city there and he gave speeches to joint sessions of Congress on the merits of socialism. Karl Marx talks a lot about about uh, about Robert Owen, in, uh, and so did Frederick Engels in the book Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. All throughout U.S. history, you will find examples of people building little socialist communities throughout U.S. history. It, it's a growing trend. What Venezuela's government has really pushed, the collectivos, you know, what, what this kind of thing is very common throughout U.S. history. And in fact, believe it or not, the Mormons, when they started, not later, when they started, the Mormons actually had a socialist edge to them. We know about Joseph Smith. Um, but one thing about the Mormons when they began is they were radical abolitionists. They were very, very opposed to slavery. They were racially integrated. They were actually black members of the Mormon church early on. Uh, and furthermore, they shared everything. They held all things in common. They, the Mormons were a, a cooperative community where all the businesses were collectively owned by the church, etc., um, but things changed, obviously. The biggest change was when they got out to Utah, when they started taking land away from Native Americans and exterminating Native Americans. That changed, that changed the character of the organization. Uh, you know, when the Mormons got to Utah and started building their, their, their community, uh, that's when the racism got, got to be a big part of what it meant to be a Mormon. Um, and you can compare the transformation of the Mormon church from a progressive institution, weird, you know, religious fanatics or whatever, but anti-racist, anti-slavery, integrated, socialistic. You can compare their transformation when they got out to Utah, settler, colonialist, racist, to what happened in Israel, right? When Israel began, many of the folks who were building those, uh, those settlements, you know, with, after the Balfour Declaration, Many of them really did believe that Israel would be a socialist commune in the desert, that they would have all things in common. Thoughts on the Amana colonies in Iowa? I don't know enough about the Amana colonies. I can't give you an answer. I, I wish I could give you more of an answer. I've never heard of them. Uh, but, you know, many, many of, of the forces who went to Israel really did believe uh, that they were going to build a socialist society. And, and, however, there were Palestinians living there. And part of, part of you know, showing up there and building their building Israel was exterminating Palestinians and ethnic cleansing and driving them out. So the character of Israel changed. And if you look at Israel's history, when Israel began, it was the Labor Party. It was recognized by the Soviet Union. But by the 1970s, you had Menachem Begin, 
uh, and pretty soon, um, pretty soon, now Israel under Netanyahu is extremely right wing. Um, you know, because because being a colonialist and being a settler and being a colonizer, being an imperialist changes you, right? That that sometimes, sometimes, I would say all the time, ideas tend to flow from material conditions, right? So it's a very, very astute observation. But I'm going to tell you folks that I think we need to start thinking about I need to really, really start thinking about, I'm not proposing anything specific here, but I just think those of us who believe in socialism need to start thinking about building socialist cities and socialist communities and cooperatives in the United States. Right now, there's so many people that are unemployed in the United States right now, so many people that are suffering. Many people are longing for economic security. Interest in socialist ideas is growing. And many people are trying to influence government policy and get people elected, but building socialist communities and cities, you know, that's, that's also a big part of what, what would need to be done. If you look at the way socialism is developing now, right, 21st century socialism seems to involve, you know, government control of major industries, but also, you know, independent collectivos and cooperatives and, and you know, stuff like Huawei stuff like uh stuff like uh, uh like lenin farms in russia stuff like uh stuff like the collectivos in venezuela this seems to be this seems to be the trend now among those who you know adhere to socialism among anti-imperialist countries and socialist countries this seems to be the trend of having these kind of cooperatives and communes that are the basis of the revolutionary government so if if an anti-imperialist and revolutionary government were to emerge in the United States, which it eventually will, the basis of it, the basis of it will be socialist communities and socialist cities and cooperative businesses. That'll be the basis, I'm sure. So we, those of us who believe in socialism, need to start thinking about what we could do to start building socialist cities. I think it needs to be done. I, I think we need to start having that conversation. What will the American Huawei look like? What will the American Lenin Farms look like? Uh, you know, what will the American Collectivos look like? Think about it. You know, what, what will it look like? What will it be like? You know, I've often made the analogy that before the American Revolution, there was a period called the Great Awakening, where in terms of religion, the American people expressed themselves by getting more politically active and such. Before the American Civil War, there was the Second Great Awakening in which the American people were becoming abolitionists and having these big revival meetings and, and arguing that the country needed to turn around and expressing themselves in terms of religion. Mormonism came out of that period. So did Seventh-day Adventism. Um, you know... Right? I argue that now we're in a period that I call the socialist awakening, the third great awakening of America. It's not a religious awakening. It's a socialist awakening. The United States is experiencing the third great awakening, the great socialist awakening of America. We're not in a revolutionary period. The revolution comes later. Right? The awakening happens beforehand. It lays the ideological groundwork. It, it, it awakens the mind and lays the basis for what comes next. The first great awakening came and laid the basis for the American Revolution. The Second Great Awakening laid the basis for the Second American Revolution, the Civil War. And I believe that the period we're in now is the period of the Third Great Awakening in which the American people are, are awakening. It is a socialist awakening. We are experiencing the socialist awakening right now, and it's painful. And we are being forced. All those things we looked the other way at for so many years, police brutality, right? The African-American community was, was facing it like you wouldn't believe. But the rest of us, you know, the rest of white society was just looking the other way and saying, well, we trust the police. That can't be true, right? In inequality, poverty. We were looking the other way. So many things that we were just looking the other way are now things that we have to face. They're just slapping us right in the face problems that needed to be resolved, decaying infrastructure, the prison industrial complex, the, the 
pharmaceutical industry that's out of control and getting people addicted to opioids, the drop in wages, the drop in living standards, militarism, war, governments becoming in debt to bankers, all these problems that for a long time we just looked the other way, it'll solve itself, it'll get better. Healthcare, it's not getting better. It's not getting better. The founders of the United States thought they could do that with slavery. Right? They wrote into the Constitution, no more slaves can be imported after 1800. And they figured, you know, this slavery thing, it'll take care of itself. Well, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. Right? And a lot of us here in the United States, this police brutality thing, it'll get better. It'll take care of itself. No, it didn't. This health care thing, it'll take care of itself. It'll get better. No, it won't. The opioid manufacturer, oh, it'll take care of itself. It'll get better. No, it didn't. Military industrial complex, no, it didn't. Right? The prison industrial complex, no, it didn't. All those problems, all those problems that so many of us try to look the other way and ignore and get back to watching football or baseball on television with, all those problems are now rising up all around us. We have procrastinated. We have ignored politics. We've, we've not been involved. And now they're all staring us in the face. We have an economic crisis, which is laying the basis for a political crisis. Let's remember that Nelson Peary, the revolutionary writer that I've drawn a lot from, he said that revolutions happen in three phases. First, first there is an economic revolution. The economic revolution get, you know, makes an old mode of production unsustainable. That gives birth to a new class, and that new class creates a social revolution with the rise of a new class. And then third, third, you have a political revolution where that new class takes power. Well, the economic revolution was called the computer revolution. It resulted in a society where you don't need workers at the assembly line, where millions are outcast and starving, where millions of working people have no role in the economy. And it created a new class of the, the unemployed, or the almost permanently unemployed, the precariat, the young people stuck in short-term, low-wage jobs, the millions of communities where people don't have sustainable employment, where people can't pay their bills, they're barely getting by, this new class of, of, of workers that barely have a place in the assembly line, that barely survive. And now, now that we have our economic revolution, the computer revolution, the new mode of production, and next we have the new class that's been created, the millions outcast and starving, created by capitalism in its new stage. Now we need to lay the basis for the third stage, the political revolution, the people, this new class, the millions of people who've been left behind by American capitalism have to start making themselves heard and they have to take control of the political system. The people have got to take their country back, which they never really had to begin with, but they have to take control. Popular power has to be mobilized. And I think it can happen. I really do think it can happen. If it's happened in so many other countries, it could very easily happen here. The societal crisis right now that we're facing lays the basis for it happening here. And the fact that socialist countries like Vietnam, like China, have handled the pandemic so much better than we have points toward the economic necessity of adopting a rationally planned economy in the United States. The means of production, the banks, factories, and industries must be organized to serve public good and not profits. We need a rationally planned economy to unleash the potential of every human being, to allow the creation of all kinds of beautiful mega corporations in which the workers share in the profits that they create, we need our natural resources to be controlled by the people. We need to mobilize the population to rebuild the country. The moment is crying out for, for the society to change. Like I said, we are experiencing the third great awakening, the great socialist awakening of America. This is the very, very beginning of it. This is the very, very beginning of it, of the change the country desperately needs. And I think we can get it. I really do. I'm optimistic. I'm, despite everything, despite everything going wrong, despite all the hardship, I believe that, that things can improve and will improve. So I thought, because I had just talked about Mormons and socialist cities and all of that, I would just conclude my opening remarks by reading you a stanza 
from the, the classic Mormon hymn, Come, Come Ye Saints. This is, this is probably one of the most important Mormon hymns up to today. And they have a stanza in it, a verse in it that goes, We'll find a place which God for us prepared far away in the West, where none shall come to hurt or make afraid. There the saints shall be blessed. We'll make the air with music breathe. Shout praises to our God and King. Above the rest, our words will tell all is well. So that concludes my opening remarks. I've got plenty of super chats to get to, but before we do that, I will take a drink of strawberry lemonade. And I'll call you out as I see you. Names and locations.